when you say like I'm a comedian, people are like, "Oh, you do stand up." <laughs> <laughs> No, there's like 30 other forms of yeah. comedy, yeah, you yeah. know? And I hate like, where do you go up? And it's like, oh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make. Hey, I'm Tim Barnes. You are the genre. And in each episode of this show, I ask someone about the first genres that inspired them, the first crafts that they pursued, and how they feel about that first craft now. Why do I do that? It's because I believe that those are the three questions that help guide you towards your true genre, not your true purpose. This isn't a cult or anything like that, but it helps you figure out what your thing is. What do you want to be doing? I hope you enjoyed the previous episode with Roy Wood Jr. That was one that I was really looking forward to, and I really think it's one of the best episodes of the podcast so far. If you listen to it, you know that he is someone who likes to strategize in his career, and I always make sure to listen to any interview that he's doing. So I'm glad that this podcast is in the pantheon of great Roy Wood Jr., conversations. And if you enjoy the show, please leave a nice review wherever you're listening to it. Tell a friend about it. It goes a long way. And I really appreciate it. In this episode, I'm talking to Anna Suzuki. She acts, she writes, she does comedy. And we met, oh wow, probably in the summer of 2016 when I first moved to New York. We were booked to do like a live panel discussion about podcasts at the Brooklyn Library. It was a great time, and I think we only met again maybe once or twice after that. But she's great at everything that she does, and I wanted to learn more about how she pulls it all off. Anna is a three-time quarter finalist of the Sundance Episodic Lab. She co-wrote and co-directed the award-winning short film Spooky Town. And as an actor, she was selected for the ABC Disney Diversity Talent Showcase and NBC Diversity Showcase. Diversity. Don't you love it? Her TV credits include Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It, New Amsterdam, High Maintenance, Will and Grace, Crashing, Orange is the New Black, and so many other shows. In this conversation, I find out that her career path mirrors the path of her own father. We talk a lot about grief, we talk a lot about comedy, and we talk a lot about Broadway. So please enjoy this surprisingly cathartic conversation with Anna Suzuki. I listened to Rob's episode. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, because well, that's how we met. Okay, I was going to ask you, Tim, uh, and I know we've started, but yeah. I was like, how do we know each other? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, yeah, it's we met at the Brooklyn Library at that downstairs theater because we were on stage for some event about podcasting. You oh had a podcast? God. I did at one point. Yeah, yeah. I had just moved to New York from Chicago where I had started this podcast called It's All True. I don't remember what yours was, but Mike Sachs was also there. And Rob is Mike Sachs's producer for his podcast. Oh, okay. I used to host a podcast called Soul Glow Project. Yes. With Keisha Zoller and Emily Shore Lesnick. This is really funny because <laughs> my husband always tells me that I have a terrible memory. Like I don't remember anything. <laughs> and even though you just described in detail for me, I don't remember this at all. Well, I remember because it was like <laughs> the first really fun, cool, official kind of thing that I did in New York. And because you recommended Cheryl's Global Soul right afterwards oh. to me and my my then girlfriend and now she doesn't like wife, so I've been experimenting with woman Part king oh. partner. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so I stepped on your woman king. That's way better than partner. <laughs> or uh, husband. She likes husband. That's another one. So I love um, that. yeah, yeah. There's something cool about um, that. Congratulations. When when did you get married? We got married in September of last year. September when? <laughs> September 12th. Oh, okay. I was going to say my wedding anniversary is September 3rd. Okay. Yeah. So we almost had something, but we don't. You know what? Now that I'm, that I feel awful. I, 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 it could be September 10th or 12th. <laughs> it definitely wasn't September 11th. <laughs> That's same. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's either the day before or the day after the day that you will never forget. That's when we got married. <laughs> Uh, well, husband. Okay, I will tell my man king, me <laughs> husband, from nice. now on. Yeah, <laughs> that's how we met. And then you just like recommending this great restaurant made you seem so cool. And then I have another very vague memory. I don't know if I booked you on a show or something, but we were at the same show. And then we like took a car together to get back home. It might have oh been because I used to produce a, a stand up show with Z Way. It could have been that. <laughs> Oh, wait, was that in Williamsburg? Yeah, that was Williamsburg. Okay, yes. I remember our car ride together, but I actually don't remember Cheryl's Global Soul (laughs) at all. (laughs) Which is a restaurant you say I recommend it. Yes, yes. Or maybe someone with you. Maybe you're... (laughs) Wow. Maybe the cohort of your podcast. Okay. I I feel like it was you. I have a memory of it being you recommending. I hope wasn't me because i don't remember that at all but. <laughs> you're like and i hate soul food <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all of this like i remember laughing so much in that car Aww. ride you bring this great communal fun energy oh and i want to i want to figure out where that came from we like we, we haven't like seen each other in so long but i've always i've always actually really liked you and it's hard for me to like comedians <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is part of my identity crisis that we'll talk about today. But I've always been like, am I a comedian? I've just always felt like I don't belong anywhere. And I've always (laughs) felt othered by everyone Uh and leaving me sort of stranded. And so I feel like as I grow older, I'm, I don't know, it's hard. I feel like comedians, sometimes myself included, we have a lot of walls up and we're not being vulnerable. And so I guess this is just my way of saying I've always felt like you were very genuine and you were like really nice. (laughs) I almost said nice for a comedian. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I appreciate that because there's like being a comedian is all about projecting an image. And sometimes even like comedians that seem open on stage, you can tell that there's something off. Yes, (laughs) yes. <laughs> Something no, you're right. Something off. Yeah. And I think that has slowly turned me off from traditional, like commercial comedy. Uh-huh. But yeah, I've always felt like even your stand-up persona was always like very likable and a a real, I don't know, like a like a genuine version of yourself. Thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because we're talking. I feel so distant from my stand-up persona, like since the pandemic. Like I, ha- I really haven't been going out, and mm-hmm. so I've been trying to get readjusted. And I think I'm getting back into my skin as a comedian, where there was just a time where I forgot what I wanted to talk about, which was scary because there was a time where I really knew, like, not specifically, but this feeling of what I wanted to do on stage and this feeling of what I wanted to talk about. So. You feel like you haven't been going up as much as you'd like to? Oh, yeah, I definitely haven't been going up. And and that's the thing. I don't know if it's as much as I'd like to, because it is very exhausting to go go out. And it's like, I, you know what? I don't need to be seen. Whatever validation I was getting from it, I don't need it as much. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I like that realization. I haven't identified as a stand-up for like eight years, but recently... (laughs) I did a show and while I was standing in the back of the room waiting to go up and watching other comics who were like, I didn't even recognize them. They were like, so yeah, like such baby comics. I like, I remember hearing my own voice say, why do I do this to myself? (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't need to do this to myself, you know? So that's sort of the battle that, um... (laughs) My new brand is like vulnerability. I'm try- I'm being really open right now. Nice, nice. Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something like when you see those younger comedians, you do start to see a younger version of yourself as well, where there is something to prove. And I think maybe the two of us have proven the thing that we kind of wanted to prove earlier on. I like that. And I think it's also like me realizing that in this industry, you don't have to do something just because you're told that that's sort of the path you're supposed to take. Mm. Like, I never got on a UCB house team, for example. So I ended up pitching a show with a few other girls, and that ended up running at the theater. Like, a good example is, I feel like every improviser and character 
comedian's goal is to be on SNL. And Mm. I know that's not for me. I have too much social anxiety. Like it's just, (laughs) it just won't be a fun work environment for me. I feel like. So I've always like said, no, I don't want to do a packet or an audition for SNL. But I guess my point is just like, in this industry, we're told that these certain steps are what you have to take to make it. And I just want to be more like honest with myself. Nice. Yeah. And I saw on your website, your bio on your website that you grew up in Japan. Yes. So, okay, let's get into it. Um, (laughs) So I guess we've never really talked about this. So I was born and raised in Japan. My mom is Japanese and my dad was Jewish. He passed away a few years ago, but we'll, Mm. we'll get into it more. Yes. Thank you. My dad Growing up, even though he, so he looked exactly like George Costanza, (laughs) like, you know, short, chubby Jew, Uh but he spoke fluent Japanese. Oh, wow. So in Japan, he was actually doing a lot of like commercials and TV and like those crazy variety shows that. Really? Yeah. I'll I'll send you. I would love to see this. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So like my dad was making uh, a living, like teaching English and also doing comedy and variety shows in Japan. So Growing up, I only spoke Japanese and I identified as a purely Japanese person. Like I didn't think I was like, I didn't have identity crisis when I was growing up in Japan because I just saw myself as a Japanese girl. And like I spoke Japanese with my Jewish dad. <laughs> so That's a great book title. That's a great book title. <laughs> So yeah, I lived in Japan until I was 12. And then my parents, my brothers and I, we all moved to New York City, to Manhattan when I was about 13. So I really didn't speak English until I was like 14, 15. And yeah, so that's that's where I come from. And ever since I moved here to America, that's been like a huge source of obviously identity crisis and yeah, I mean, do you, sh- should we talk about the genre? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get into, let's get into it. Sorry, sorry no, no. to drive this. <laughs> well, with all of this in mind, like the, I've been waiting for like you know the perfect moment to ask this because <laughs> this is very fascinating. You grew up in Japan and you felt. I am a Japanese girl. You move to America and that gets complicated. And I'm sure in horrifying ways, honestly. For me, it became very complicated because in America, when you say I'm a first generation Japanese immigrant, people have a very specific idea of what that person is. And that's not someone that looks like me or sounds like me. You know, that's not someone who is multiracial, speaks English fluently, kind of looks like (laughs) <laughs> like Miss Swan, like what I like, I you know I don't look or sound like anything that people expect a Japanese immigrant to be, and so I found myself in this space where like I was no longer really accepted by my motherland because I had adapted too much to the Western world, and then like yeah, I I just found myself in a really uncomfortable place where like not a lot of people could relate. That's sort of, yeah, when my crisis started after I moved here, because I Mm. it was like, what am I? But yeah, I was thinking about (laughs) your genre question. I haven't asked a question yet. (laughs) Okay, okay. (laughs) Hold on. Okay, let's go back. Um, So that's when my identity crisis started. (laughs) Okay. So I'm interested in this because you moved to America at, to New York specifically. To Manhattan, yeah. Manhattan. At age 14. 13. 13, 13. Mm-hmm. So you already have established all of these pop cultural things that you love in Japan. And now you're absorbing all kinds of new stuff when you get to Manhattan. So maybe there's two genres. I don't know. But what is the first genre <laughs> that called to you when you were a kid? I know listeners can't see my face, but yes, there are two genres. Or I don't know. Maybe the, are you, I don't know if you're using this video. But... No, no, no video. Oh, okay, okay, too much, okay, okay. Video is too much work. Okay, great. Yeah. Then I'll take off my top. Uh, <laughs> So I was thinking, growing up in Japan, there were two genres that really influenced me, not looking back. And one is Ghibli movies. 
I don't know if you're familiar, but basically it's like the biggest Japanese animation studio. If you have any friends who are like obsessed with Japan or like, yeah, yeah. if you've, if you look into anything Japanese culture, you'll recognize these characters, but it's like my neighbor Totoro and Spirited um, Away. Is that Spirited Away is the same? Yes. Um, but the ones that I watched as a child were like late eighties, early nineties, Ghibli's. So, but the same family. Yeah. Spirited Away. And those movies, there was no cynicism. Everything was really earnest. And the themes were always so universal. And then when I became a little bit older in Japan, I obviously watched a lot of variety shows and comedy shows. And it's so hard to describe. Like, I think this is only relatable if you maybe grew up in two countries. But the sense of humor in Japan is so indescribable to people in the West. Like, you know, when you think of Japanese variety shows and game shows, I think most Americans think like, <laughs> oh, look at those crazy Japanese people climbing up like a lubed, uh, you know, like a, <laughs> like a stair full of lube. Like it's a lot yeah, of wacky yeah. slaps. Sound like, effects. Sound effects. Flashing yeah. lights. Yeah, yeah, like sumo wrestlers pushing you down. Just like <laughs> a lot of wacky stuff like that. But growing up, watching that as a middle schooler, a lot of it was really smart, really self-aware, really satirical. I mean, of course, there's a lot of slapstick that I loved too. I'll send you this clip later, but, or maybe we can post it as supplemental material. Yeah, like, there we go. Like cereal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's this, there was a recent sketch where this sketch group, like this girl is introducing her new boyfriend to her family and she takes him to meet her family and then they get to the house and the house is slanted mm -hmm. so it's like they have to, it's really hard to i mean it's not hard to describe you just have to watch it but <laughs> this guy's trying to meet his girlfriend's family but the house is slanted i'm so already laughing to... i like it already <laughs> I totally understand. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. <laughs> there's obviously basic slapstick stuff like that. But like one of my favorite shows ever growing up was these comedians. They would play this game where they would dress up like like a bike gang, like tough guys. But then actually never mind. This is like <laughs> so hard to describe on a on a podcast. But <laughs> They would basically do like very academic wordplay, but dressed as bike gangs and just a lot of juxtaposition and satirical stuff that was just so self-aware and so smart. And so that's the kind of comedy I grew up with. I, <laughs> I feel like I just used the most difficult to describe show <laughs> as an example. I'm going to try to come up with something Got that makes more sense verbally. These were the two genres in Japan. Yeah. Did something change when you got to Manhattan? In New York, I remember the first shows I watched were Friends and Seventh Heaven. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Did you ever watch Seventh Heaven? I did watch Seventh Heaven. You I'm very did? embarrassed about the fact. Yeah, I did. <laughs> it was a very cozy family. It was, you're right. It was really cozy. I also watched 90210 and I <laughs> was like, I didn't realize all those actors were like 35. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's always what it is. And the locker is always bigger than they are. When you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the shift was kind of jarring because in Japan, I felt like the content was very earnest and very cerebral, very subversive, very smart. And then a lot of the stuff that I was suddenly exposed to here in America was like, it felt very commercial and sort of lacking sincerity. And I mean, maybe I'm just saying this in hindsight. I don't <laughs> think I thought this as a 13 year old, uh -huh. but the heart was not there. Yeah. Then again, you are comparing Japanese sketch comedy to Seventh Heaven. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think that may be the disconnect. <laughs> oh my god, that's that's the title of my yeah, autobiography. 
Japanese sketch comedy to seventh heaven. <laughs> seventh heaven. Yeah. I like the idea of you watching that and be like, I get it. This is cerebral comedy, right? There's no way that this is an actual <laughs> dramatic show. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, that is a jarring <laughs> shift. So uh, what what is it about the Studio Ghibli? I'm saying that right, Ghibli. Yeah. I was gonna say mm-hmm. Ghibli, Ghibli. And uh Well, the, maybe in, yeah. maybe in English it is Ghibli. In Japanese it's Ghibli, but I don't okay. know. Yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. We'll we'll look it up. I'll be in the <laughs> <laughs> That'll be in the supplemental materials. Too, yeah, okay, okay. Along with the yeah. court records. We haven't even gotten to the court record yet. <laughs> But what is it about those characters? And is it because it is very open to like a child's imagination and that you kind of thought you could wander in those worlds? Um, Like one of my favorite movies is Kiki's Delivery Service or in Japanese, it was Majo no Takyubin. But we'll put that in. Sounds much more intriguing that way. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The theme is pretty simple. The story is about a 13-year-old girl who's a witch. And in this world, once a witch turns 13, she has to leave her hometown and go move to a new city and go find herself. It's it's basically like a, a s- small fish. What is that? Oh, like a coming of age story. Small fish in a big, big pond, pond. Fish out of water. Fish out of water. Yeah, exactly. all, all the fish. Yeah. Yes, you know, exactly. Teach a fish um, to swim. You know. <laughs> teach, no, <is> yeah. <laughs> teach a fish to swim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Teach a witch to swim. Exactly. That's the basic story. But I, I love it because the theme is so universal. I was re-watching it yesterday, actually, and I just found myself like crying so much. And I didn't realize it would hit me so hard as a woman in my 30s. But, you know, it's so universal. We all go through this, like going to a new place or not even physically, maybe even emotionally entering a new place. And it's scary and we don't know anyone. I think it's just so I don't know. What do I what do I like about it? Well, I'm already seeing a connection here because you followed the same path as this character. You, at age 13, you moved from Japan. (laughs) Wait, Tim, I seriously didn't make that connection. Am I stupid? (laughs) I mean, that's a big deal. Like, you you love this this, show. I'm I'm firing Joyce, my therapist, right now. (laughs) And I'm hiring you. Sorry. (laughs) Wow. That's crazy. You you like blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you are a witch. <laughs> You're writing a Disney Channel original movie. I just watched the movie Twitched the other day. Have you seen that? No. With uh, Tia and Tamara? No. You should have skipped Seventh Heaven and gone straight to the Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Disney. <laughs> well, we don't have to get too much into Friends because everyone watched Friends. But Friends did teach me a lot about American culture that or like the world that I didn't know like in Japan at least when I was growing up in the suburbs in the 90s I didn't know gay people existed like homosexuality is was such a taboo in Japan at the time that like when Ross married a lesbian like I didn't know I was like what's a lesbian that's I didn't so you know friends (laughs) friends did teach me real cool stuff. Um, so in that sense, I did grow up on Friends, but I don't, yeah, I don't remember what, uh, what I learned from some of them. <laughs> so you have a father who was Japan famous. No way. <laughs> right? That's how you kind of described it. He was sort of like a semi-regular he was, presence. He was a working actor, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Who was doing a lot of comedy. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to Manhattan, Mm -hmm. the whole family moved to Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Was he still doing that type of work? Um, He slowly stopped because in New York, he was like just another Jew. (laughs) Just another George. Just another George Costanza. (laughs) To go into a diner and it's just a bunch of George Costanza talking Um, to their Seinfelds. (laughs) 
So yeah, he did. He slowly stopped acting over here, but and maybe we'll get into this later. But I do feel like part of me pursuing this path is like fulfilling his dream. Mm. Yeah, out of like a sincere want. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I remember one of the coolest memories I have in Japan is so in the '90s there was a really really big pop group called Sumapu, which is like the Backstreet Boys of Japan. Mm. And my dad was filming a TV show with one of the guys. And he let me take off from school to come with him wow. on set. Yeah. And like, imagine, was there like a, pop, well, I don't know. Was there like a pop star you liked when you were a kid? A or like a movie star, star? A movie star. Um, I guess Robin Williams. Yeah. Or, okay. Great. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, like, imagine like one of your parents, you know, takes you to work one day, and they're like working with Robin Williams, and you get to hang out with him for the day. You know, yeah. it was. I felt so cool. Um. So that was that's like a really sweet memory I have with my dad. But I feel like now I'm sort of following in his path. You know, like I've shot commercials with famous people and. It's, I mean, obviously I want to do it. I'm not doing it for my dad, but it's almost like my dad slowly quit acting to support the family and get a real job. And mm -hmm. I feel like I am fulfilling his dream. That's wonderful. It has to feel great. Yeah, That's it does. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before you started doing acting and comedy and all these multitude of things that you feel in flux about, was there a first craft that you pursued? Yeah. Um, when I was listening to, when I was listening to Rob's episode, I was like, oh, this is, this is the same, but, uh, <laughs> um, I was always a musical theater kid. Musical theater, and okay. Yeah. In, even in Japan, I remember there used to be this Yamaha piano store near my house. They used to have musical theater class above the piano store. So I would go every Saturday to this musical theater class and we would all like work on one musical for three months and then present it at like the local town performing arts center. So yeah, I always sang and danced as a kid. I think Broadway was always like a big, big dream really? of mine. Yeah. And I actually went to college for musical theater. So I do sing in my wildest dreams. I'll keep working in TV. I'll, you know, I'll make a steady living and then mm. I'll like be on Broadway. Really? Would be okay. my dream. Yes. Don't scroll away. You Are the Genre will be right back after the break. You Are the Genre is an independently produced podcast, which means that I just do this on my own. I am booking the guests. I am editing the episodes and I'm getting a lot out of it. I hope you're getting a lot out of it. If you'd like to support it in any way, there is a newsletter component to the podcast. You can find a link to it in the show notes or at youarethegenre.com. You can sign up for either a free subscription to the newsletter, giving you all kinds of updates on the things that I'm up to, or upgrade to a paid subscription to the newsletter, which gives you advanced episodes of the podcast and all kinds of other perks. You may have noticed over the course of this first year of the podcast that I've been talking a lot about the Sonar Podcast Network. I've been a guest on some great shows there like Doing It With Mike Sachs and Killed to Death. And I also co-host a podcast about Star Wars with my friend Jim Fagan. We used to work at Comedy Central together. And that podcast is joining the Sonar Podcast Network. Our first episode with them launches, or launched, depending on when you're listening to this, May 31st. And here is a trailer that Jim put together to get you excited about it. Taking your first step into a larger world. Hey, I'm Tim Barnes. I've written for The Tonight Show, all that, and more. I'm Jim Fagan. I've written, directed for ABC, Comedy Central, and also more. Along with Greg Iwinski, who drops in on occasion. I guess you could call him a force host. Canonically, Canonically I'm, I'm dead. dead. And this is Yubnub, TV and movie making from a Star Wars point of view. Here at Yubnub, we talk Star Wars, which we love, and television and film, which we make and also love. We interview the people who make Star Wars and other heavy hitters from the internet. 
entertainment industry, like the host of The High Republic show, Christina Ariel. Hair in Star Wars is so important to me. Like Lizzo's character with braids and the getting to wear my afro in Star Wars. Writer for The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Felipe Torres Medina. There are Star Wars that I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And then there are episodes where, yeah, I went to Star Wars. How was it? It was Star Wars. I like Star Wars. And Saturday Night Live's James Austin Johnson. George Lucas can't <laughs> pronounce doesn't. any character's names. Of course, yeah, nobody we're... liked Chewbacca. Nobody liked Han. <laughs> no one liked Leah. Next season is going to be our best yet. With a fresh new start as part of the Sonar Podcast Network for a season we're calling the Summer of George. It's a hot George summer looking at all of the media that inspired George Lucas to create Star Wars and all of the films he made leading up to it. Buck Rogers, THX, American Graffiti, you get it. This is a Star Wars podcast for people who actually like Star Wars. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and to all of our socials at YubNubPod. Peace! So please, subscribe to YubNub, keep subscribing to You Are the Genre, and get all of the information you need at youarethegenre.com. Now, back to the episode. Where were we? So what, the whole thing of being on Broadway, I guess it's <laughs> yeah. because you can be on Broadway for like two or three years. Is that what it is? Because mm-hmm. you're saying it like, I'll be on broad, like Broadway forever. Is it one show? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just, I love singing and I love being, I love singing funny songs. Okay. I feel like now the industry is catching up to it a little bit, but Traditionally, I feel like Broadway or musical theater has kind of always lacked a sense of humor or like Mm. the humor was very corny and mainstream (laughs) to me. You know, it wasn't like like the like satirical humor that I like. And now I feel like the two art forms are kind of it's coming together. Like, have you ever seen have you seen Schmigadoon? I saw the show. I saw the Apple show. Yes, yeah. the Apple yeah. show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So like I feel like the art form of musical theater and like smart comedy writing is slowly coming together in recent years. So I have hope. But um that's not what you asked. Um going back to what you asked about <laughs> what is it about Broadway no I don't really care about how long I'm in a show for but like when you're performing I don't know like you when you you when you do stand up you there's that immediate reaction from the audience right that's like you can't find it in any other art form so for me I love singing funny songs but I feel like (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like Broadway, it's Broadway, a feeling. Broadway it's, a, it's a, a feeling. It's a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see a lot of Broadway shows as a kid? When I moved to New York, the first show I saw was called 42nd Street. It's like this big tap musical. And oh. when the curtains came up and I saw all these feet tapping, <laughs> I was like, this is it. This, th- it gave me chills. And the show, the show itself is like, you know, it's like a classic musical. It's nothing. It's not like smart comedy writing. But um, <laughs> I was like, and I like, I'm not even a tapper, but I was like, oh my god, this is what I want to do. So yeah, I, I yeah, growing up, I watched a lot of musicals. Yeah. Did it in some way feel like an American equivalent to the Japanese shows you're watching? Oh, that is a that is a. Good question. Yeah, I guess in a way, like American, (laughs) or at least, yeah, there's like live comedy or sketch comedy has that you have a relationship with the audience, right? So maybe, I don't know. That's an interesting question. It sounds like you're saying that Americans sincerely trying to make a piece of art on stage are accidentally making an absurd Japanese <laughs> comedy. <laughs> you're so you're so um, good at yeah describing what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but musical theater was the first craft that I really got into as a child, and then as a young adult. And then another thing. I did. And when I listened to that episode, I heard you talking about Vice. I didn't know you worked at Vice. Yeah. But for a long time, I I was a translator and I did translation for Vice as well. 
So how was that journey for you? How was the, <laughs> how was vice land? <laughs> it was fun. I mean, I feel like as translators, we didn't really have a relationship yeah. with the, with production that much. So yeah. they'd be like, here are the files. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, they said it cool and vice like, right? <laughs> It did feel really cool. Um, (laughs) Have you ever seen the rings? Some people, some of the elite members of Vice had these golden Vice rings. What? Really? No. It's true. Like a like an act like a ring on your finger. Yeah, that had the Vice logo on it. Oh my god! No, I didn't know that was a thing. We we were not offered that as translators, (laughs) as subtitle translators. I didn't know that was a thing. During the strike, actually, I feel like now we're really going on a tangent, but during the strike last year, I was like kind of panicking, like, oh, maybe I should just get a real office job. Mm -hmm. And so I interviewed with Pokemon. What? Um, Okay. What is your life? (laughs) Maybe I should get a real (laughs) office job. So I interviewed Pokemon. They were, they were, where is Pokemon? They're based in Seattle. Um, <laughs> no, I was really having a crisis. I and was like, a crisis? Yeah, I was like, yeah. Maybe, like my husband and I can just move to Seattle and start a new <laughs> life. Pokemon. Yeah, and You'll never guess what I what happened today at the Pokemon. <laughs> <office>. <laughs> they were looking for a translator for. I mean, I don't even know if this game has come out yet, but they're looking for uh, some translators for their new video game and I went through I don't know if I'm even allowed to talk about this but I don't care I went through like <laughs> four rounds of interview it was like it was very corporate uh-huh. um I I did like a four hour translation test where I had to translate out of context video game dialogue it was really intense and then the final final guy he was like this very Japanese boss I think he didn't like me so I ended up not being hired but The crafts that I, I'm trying to bring this back to the theme of the podcast. (laughs) The crafts. Well, I'm fascinated. I could listen to this forever. (laughs) The crafts that I enjoyed growing up were musical theater. And then also I, I always loved translating. So those were sort of the two passions slash translation is a job, I guess. But yeah, two passions I had. And was your mom accepting of the arts? Yeah. My parents were always super supportive, which I recognize as a privilege as an artist. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like a lot of people don't have supportive families when you're pursuing the arts. So I think part of my confidence comes from my parents always being like, you can do whatever you want. We'll come. (laughs) Yeah, we'll come see your show. Like my parents used to always come see my shows and I sometimes I would play my dad's videos at comedy shows and wow, yeah. be like, and Phil Silverstein is here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and he would like get up and do a Q and a with me. Nice. So is your family supportive? Yeah. Yeah. They were very supportive. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 same thing. I realized how rare that is. And uh, I, yeah, we have to learn to see the privilege of it because yeah, uh, when you have supportive parents, even I was like, Oh, all my friends and, and middle and high school have divorced parents and I'm this loser with a stable household. <laughs> <laughs> they're all like doing all yeah. this cool stuff. They got all these new, you know, they're edgy. They got like, they're developing their personality in these intense ways. And I go home seventh heaven again. <laughs> Are you the, do you have siblings? Are you the youngest? I'm the oldest. I have a little sister. Yeah. Oh, you're the, okay. Yeah. I'm the oldest too. Okay. Nice. Um, find, finding parallels here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great that your family was supportive. Yeah, it's I get it's not rare, but it's also not necessarily yeah. that common, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like um, there's so many things I want to talk to you about that um, we are. I'm going on a lot of tangents. <laughs> no, this is great. It sounds like we have to hang out soon. That's yeah. really what it is. Yes, yes. Oh, another musical theater, another thing. So I went to this tiny private school on the Upper East Side. I I was on scholarship. Like I, we definitely could not have afforded that. But there were a lot of like celebrity kids. And I auditioned for the drama club 
we were doing Greece one year and I auditioned for the drama club. And at this point I was able to speak English. So I was like, I used to audition for roles and like they would give me non-speaking roles because my English was really bad. But by the time we were doing Greece, I could speak English. So I auditioned and they were like, we're going to, we're definitely going to give you Rizzo. Rizzo is like a juicy role. Oh, um, I didn't know that. I was like, oh, this is like before Lizzo became Lizzo. She was Rizzo. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, got it. Okay. Um, no, totally unrelated. But <laughs> They were like, we're going to give you this big juicy role. And then the next day they posted the names of the, of the cast and they gave it to, and maybe we need to bleep this out, but they gave it to Zoe Kravitz. Wow. I went to high school with her. So you are living uh, in a Studio Ghibli world. Everything I'm hearing, <laughs> everything I'm hearing is, I, mean, I guess I'll fall back on translating for Pokemon. <laughs> I went to high school with a bunch of <laughs> Nepo babies. <Yeah. laughs> I appreciate you um, making this sort of connection for me because, <laughs> because honestly, today I was like, I don't want to over prepare. I just uh, want to freestyle. So I was like fighting my anxiety to prepare for uh, this podcast. And so you connecting the dots is appreciated. So you like to plan. Yeah, Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, same. Yeah. The part of like this podcast, I'm doing it on my own, but I like having the routine of, you know, jumping ahead to make sure I have enough recorded, releasing it every yeah. week, all that kind of thing. And uh, the arts is incredibly uncertain. So the more that you can plan, the more that you can, I can at least feel stable as projects go back and forth and all that kind of stuff. And do you also like to prepare in terms of your art? Like if you had to do someone else's podcast, like would you do a lot of research or uh, if you had to do like crowd work, <laughs> would, you, would you prepare some jokes? No, no. I mean, I am learning to prepare more like the rare times I do go out. I do um, outline more than I ever did. But I think I'm I'm learning to appreciate outlining as a skill. But for going on someone else's podcast, I typically don't. If it's just talking, I don't do too much research. But if it is one of those like informational kind of things, I will. But I am in that camp of people who's like, oh, exciting, free therapy when someone has like (laughs) one of those just like interview shows. (laughs) When when you say outline, do you mean like for this podcast? Uh, No, no, I don't really outline for this. Uh, And sometimes that's why I created this uh, system, which is partly inspired by uh, Andy Richter's podcast. He has one called The Three Questions where it's where do you come from? where are you going and where are you headed or something like that? Where do you come from or where have you been and where are you going? Those are the history mm. questions. Um, and a lot of, I listen to a lot of uh, writing and craft podcasts. And so I wanted to fuse all that, but having the basis of this makes it so that I don't really have to do research. <laughs> <laughs> it is a cheat code for a great conversation. <laughs> Okay, yeah. got it. You can try it. I- Everyone can try asking the three <laughs> questions that I ask on this podcast <laughs> in your everyday life. And I'm telling you, it, it works perfectly. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, I think the theme of this podcast is really wonderful. And actually, the your theme song made me feel so much more comfortable about coming on and talking. Because I've always felt like, um, like, yeah, I don't know how to describe myself like I you know when when you say like I'm a comedian people are like oh you do stand up <laughs> <laughs> it's like no there's like 30 other forms of yeah. comedy yeah, yeah you know yeah. and I hate like where do you go up and it's like oh god yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like um, that question and how tall are you I don't understand what you're doing with this information wait <laughs> Wait, you get how tall are you? Yeah, and I I don't know how tall I am. And if I gave you the answer, what are you going to do with it? But how tall are you? I think I'm like six foot something. That's tall. Because you, like, I feel like you could either be a short king or (laughs) like a tall king. You can read either. Yeah. (laughs) That's great. I should be getting more roles. But but what are you, when someone tells you their height, are you putting that like on a scale system in your head? I do nothing. I just see a tall person. I see a short person. And I say, hey, that's a tall person. Hey, that's a short person. I don't need to know the exact. 
I think it helps to visualize, like, put you in context of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm getting nothing out of it. And I never want to know. I don't want. As the, yeah. as the person providing the information. Yeah, but I never want to know from anyone else. I don't want to know how tall you, you are. You don't want to know that I'm 5'3". No, it means nothing to me. Okay. Sorry. Well, it sounds like you That's okay. It. I'm- <laughs> So yeah, so your theme song w- where it goes, um, I forgot it goes like T- like tell us what makes you you or uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, my friend Freddie Nunez, who was in another episode of the show, oh, uh, wrote the song and sings it. Yeah, yeah that made um, me feel really good. Nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is getting really vulnerable. <laughs> Well, you'll love to know that it did that. And I hear, yeah, he gets a lot of compliments for that theme song. Oh, it's a good. wonderful theme song. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> these are all of the the things that you were influenced by. This was the first craft that you pursued. You're such a good host. Thank you. <laughs> I love, like, yeah, I love this, like, recap. And then the third question. <laughs> yeah, and then the, yeah. here comes the third question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, what is my relationship to this craft now? Yes, yes. I think we're co-hosting. I think, okay, okay. See, this is this is what happens. Like, I'm an over-preparer, uh-huh. but this is the only way I can sort of overcome my performance anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like, if I prepare 200%, then I'll perform 75%. Mm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But it seems like, yeah, I can see these these different aspects of yourself dancing around. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. saying that. Um, okay, so my relationship to this craft. Okay, so I feel like I've spent my 20s sort of not really understanding my comedic voice. Like, I think we probably met at a time where I was kind of doing stand-up, but I wasn't really sure if I truly enjoyed it, but I wasn't like in tune with my, I wasn't in touch with my inner voice in my twenties. You know, Mm -hmm. I was just like trying to be really strategic about my career and like doing the kinds of stand up I saw other people do. Oh, and this actually kind of goes back to um, Kiki's delivery service that Mm -hmm. I was talking about this Ghibli movie. The movie is about this 13 year old witch who starts a delivery business And so she's no longer flying for fun, but she's flying because it's a job now. And she sort of starts to lose the joy and love of flying. And she loses her magic because it has become a job. Oh, my goodness. This is really deep. This is really deep. And it it is so ingrained (laughs) in your life story. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like my 20s, I spent like trying to be strategic about comedy and like trying to find my brand. And then I think I felt a little burnt out a few years ago. So now I'm trying to work on this one woman musical, which Mm. I feel like is such a, (laughs) I hate saying that because those are like two genres Mm. that everyone hates, you know? Yeah. yeah, Your mind goes wild when you hear those words. (laughs) (laughs) Like like the two most controversial yeah, genres, yeah, yeah. solo shows yeah. and musicals. Just imagine a crying woman tap dancing. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Um, but I want to write a solo show with, a, let's say, with original music mm. about my grief journey about losing my dad and like what it means as a Japanese person who lost a Jewish dad, mm. you know? So I want to write something that's like, <laughs> that like I don't want to worry about something being commercial anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I want to write something like I want to go back to why I started performing in the first place and why it used to bring me joy because it's really hard for me to like <laughs> like I talk about this in therapy a lot and I talk about this with other creatives but when people say like what brings you joy or like what's fun for you to write and do? My business brain is so loud mm-hmm. that it's hard for me to be like, wait, what what makes me laugh? Yeah. You know, yeah, like I'm always thinking about it. Yeah. Like I'm always thinking about it from like 
<laughs> like, like, what would my manager want to see? You know, yeah. like, just like a business perspective. So yeah. it's hard for me to, I'm still working on it, but. Nice. Well, yeah. I, I feel like um, we're talking about like so much of, it feels like the journey of a lot of people in the arts <laughs> and uh, we're talking about comedians, like so much of comedy is about projecting and so much about being young is like, you, you consume all this stuff and you watch all this stuff about these these archetypes that you want to be. And then you kind of wear these and then you kind of project it out. But then it feels like to discover what you actually want to do is to be like, oh, what what's projecting out isn't me. I am a thing. I am a projector. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are the parts of this thing that's shooting these images out? And the more that you can get back to that, I think you're just writing in a genuine space and it doesn't matter how it lands. Writing in a genuine space. Yeah. Well, can you say that projector thing again? <laughs> <laughs> I I want to I want to under I want to understand. <laughs> well, it's like you you all I always think about like oh this image that I want to forge this thing that I want to and I'm I'm worried about perception I'm worried about the thing that is shooting out but I'm not thinking about the thing the <laughs> the me of it I'm thinking about uh, the outside, you know what I mean? So I guess it's just outside versus inside. Yes. Yes. I went to see this. I'm not going to name the show, but I went to see this musical recently. I love going to the theater by myself. That's like not even a guilty pleasure. It's a pleasure of mine. That's great. Um, and you know, it. And you're saying it with pride. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love seeing musicals by myself. It was like, it was by a playwright that I really love. And this show was like, I didn't, I didn't love it. And I think, me in my 20s would have been like, oh, I would kill to be in this mm. like commercial success, just be part of this. And me now in my 30s, I, wa- I saw this show and I thought I would rather, I think, like, yeah, create something for myself, something that makes me laugh and maybe 30 people come to it than like be part of something commercially successful, but like I don't believe in. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. The arts is hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you navigating your grief journey? Um, thank you for asking. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I feel like now we're getting to the really good stuff mm. at 55 minutes in. I know. But... That's always how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up. My family didn't really talk about feelings at all. And so it's extremely uncomfortable for me to be vulnerable with my family. We just don't talk about feelings. And so a lot of my dad's stuff, I feel like we're still suppressing. We just still don't talk about it that much. Like I haven't posted about it on social media once Mm. and it's been like three years, Mm. you know, it feels very vulnerable and uncomfortable to be like open with my grief. But I realized that I want to be, Mm. I was just not raised that way. And I was like, Oh, this is what breaking the cycle means in therapy. Like, (laughs) I was like, oh, so we have my family has this cycle, but I want to talk about it. And I feel guilty because I feel like I'm betraying my family. So I want to talk about it by writing a musical. (laughs) (laughs) Is your mom still around? I feel like I haven't. Yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah. Do you think that she will attend this at some point? Do you (laughs) You know? Yeah, I, I I casually brought it up the other day just to gauge her reaction. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm thinking about writing a show about dad. And she was like, oh. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she's not opposed to it. I think mm-hmm. she'll be fine. Um, but it's definitely like, this is like a very new chapter of my life like being open with my grief and sharing it with the world publicly is yeah you are one of the first people to know I'm trying to do this like my (laughs) my grief journey yeah 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 
Well, and and then my f- millions of listeners will know as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is so scary. <laughs> so both of your parents weren't open or was it more your mom that wasn't very like emotionally open? We were never like a physically affectionate family. And maybe that is because I spent a lot of my childhood years in Japan. Maybe it is a cultural thing, but yeah, yeah I just like I've never hugged my mom I don't Mm. think we Mm. it's just it was not a very like verbally and physically affectionate household we're very very close like Mm. we connect via humor you know but um not very vulnerable family so it is part cultural but do you think there's there are personal reasons your mom is that guarded and your dad was that guarded I think um when Oh my gosh, this is this is the good stuff. My, uh, <laughs> well, it's like we got five more minutes, and you five know, more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it always is in therapy, too. Uh, <laughs> so my dad moved to Japan when he was like eighteen, and he lived in Japan for about uh, for like twenty years, maybe. No, he lived in Japan for a long time, and when he moved there, my parents faced a lot of. My dad experienced a lot of racism and backlash for being a white man in Mm. Japan, Um, which is, yeah, it's, it's an odd concept from the Western lens. Uh, (laughs) Like, like my dad couldn't rent an apartment because he was a foreigner. My grandparents didn't attend their wedding Mm. because he was white. You know, they, they faced a lot of adversity. So I think they kind of learned how to, um, just like protect themselves and learn how to fend for themselves and sort of not ask for help, mm. you know? And so I think that's kind of how I was raised and yeah. it's not like asking for help is weak or bad, but it's just like embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we just like never talked about feelings growing up um i feel feel really strange that i'm sharing this now and i know we literally (laughs) have two minutes left no it's only two minutes left and uh i've been trying (laughs) i feel like we didn't talk about your actual themes at all (laughs) no we did we did and uh maybe we'll get you back for a part two Um, but um yeah i've also um been going through uh well i actually didn't really tell me about your trauma so i feel actually, yeah, so i'm gonna tell you a little bit about my trauma <laughs> uh my grandfather my mom's dad passed away last mm. year a couple weeks before the wedding and we went to the funeral oh a couple gosh, days after the wedding so it was mm. a lot of it was interesting go, going having this wedding and then going to a funeral and going <laughs> going on a honeymoon like yeah. all these things swirling together but i also didn't realize leading up to it because we all kind of knew it was coming for a couple of years. I didn't realize how much I was pre grieving and how much that impacted a lot of my work. Like I, a lot of the things that I was writing, there are nuggets of things about my grandfather in there and the conversations that I was trying to have with him near the end were trying to crack through this um, wall of, of not really talking about emotions, uh, but definitely having routine and everything else. And you always, I always knew the underlying emotion in a lot of my family, I know the underlying emotion of specific acts. And it's Mm. always, uh, lately I think about it in terms of like um, when you are writing a screenplay, they always say show, don't tell, like find ways to tell the story visually. And I do think that um, there is a specific way that quiet families or non verbal, um, non emotionally verbal families They do express these things, but it's just in in very different ways. And it's really hard to translate to people who have very uh, vocally open and and emotional families. Um, Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Were you close with your grandfather? Yes. Not super close, but also very Mm -hmm. close. It was was interesting. And I lived with him uh, for about uh, six months when I got my first TV writing job in L.A. So that was like a very fascinating uh, experience. And... uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, wait, which, which, which job you can, you can blow this up <laughs> if you need to. No, was, uh, the re- recent revival of all that. So, oh, you no, know, it was really cool. It was really fun. You, and, oh, I didn't realize you worked on that. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's um, such a cool job. I know it's a dream come true. Um, I, I used to watch it as a kid, and um, Wait, yeah, but you yeah. lived with your grandfather during that. Yeah, because he he lived in L.A. and I was in New York, and I had to like move to L.A. Yeah. in like a week. And so, and also it just, whenever I went to LA, I was like, well, it's a great excuse to visit family and to visit my grandpa and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And that was um, directly the inspiration of this project that I'm working on that's kind of moving along slowly now. But um, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that to see if that inspired anything in you of like, um, it seems like this is the thing that you're trying to break, the generational thing that, you, <laughs> that you're trying to break. But also yeah. I wanna, under, if you see a value of the way that it is as well or was that always a challenge the i think the cycle i'm trying to break is and i i so a lot of times i find myself thinking like i'll hear myself say in my head like oh i should tell my mom i love her right now i do i do that a lot i do that really i don't say so many things out loud because it feels like that's gonna be weird right What's it going to sound like? I sound robotic when I say emotional things. Yes. But, but, <laughs> but the weird thing is I'm a, I'm a very vulnerable, open person with anyone else. Like with, <laughs> Except for the, per, the people that, yeah. With yeah. my main king, like <laughs> <laughs> with all my friends. I'm a soup. I'm a really clear communicator with everyone else. But with my mom and my brothers, I'll hear myself. Like there's like a filter mm-hmm. and my brain will say, Say I love you right now. Uh-huh. You know, say, thank thank them. <laughs> tell, them tell them you're grateful. <laughs> yeah. And then like it won't come out of my mouth because it feels so awkward. Yeah. It also it also might be um a language thing because I speak in Japanese with my mom and one of my brothers, and my other brother I speak to in English. So it like Maybe it's a language thing. I don't know. But that's the cycle I'm trying to break. Like if I hear it in my head. I want to get used to just saying it or like, I don't feel comfortable crying in front of my family. That's something I'm practicing. <laughs> my therapist was like, why don't you try in front of one brother and see how you're crying? Feel? <laughs> <laughs> There's always chopping onions around his family. <laughs> I had to, I had to like, uh, like the last couple of years of my grandpa's life, I had to train him to say, I love you at the end of a call. I used to say, I love you. Then the phone would click. But also at the same time, the pause before the click told me, I love you too. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting that you had to train him. That's almost like what I want to do to myself. I want to train myself. Mm. To verbalize these feelings. Yeah. It's like routine. It's just, yeah. it's awkward. To, it's like, I, I assume learning lines for a play. Yeah. It's like working out. Like the hardest thing is to go to the gym. Yeah. You know, the hardest thing is to say, yeah. 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 Um, well, thank you for sharing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm handing the podcast over to you. <laughs> Um, uh, and next, next week, week on the we'll have Tim Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is this has uh, been great, surprisingly cathartic, and yeah, uh, yeah. I wish you nothing but the best. That's the word, cathartic. I want to create things that are cathartic for me. Yeah, and yeah. But thank you. I wish you nothing but the best. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to Anna Suzuki for stopping by the show. Get more information about her at HelloAnnaSuzuki.com. Freddie Nunez created and sings the You Are the Genre theme song, and Adam Smith produced it. Next week, writer Michael Denzel Smith joins me on the podcast, but you can listen to it a week ahead of the normies if you subscribe to the newsletter. This is Tim Barnes signing off with your weekly reminder that you are the genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. We can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make.